Her childhood, of course, was idyllic, um, you know, partly because she was a child of intensely loving parents, loving towards one another, but also loving towards her and her sister. That bond between the, the, the two royal sisters, who you know, one poet rather charmingly described as two royal buds of spring, was a very strong one. And of course, um, uh, the Duke of York was, was, was very keen on that, that sense of, of this family as a quartet. And, and fully supported by his wife, I think that there is certainly something to be said for the fact that the future Queen Elizabeth, the, the Queen Mother, was appalled by her husband's family, by his own upbringing, by, by her parents-in-law's parenting. A, a, and she rescued him, really, from a, a slightly arid emotional zone and, and, a, and clearly um, liberated in him loving tendencies from which Princess Elizabeth benefited tremendously. In those days, when the a queen was um, a young princess. Um, the royal family didn't work nearly as hard as they do now, and the Duke and Duchess of York, um, her parents, uh, did a certain number of engagements, but they would merrily disappear up to Scotland for about three months, and so it was a very, very family-oriented situation. And so um, I don't think that she had any expectation that she would do anything very much on a national level. Of course, she appeared. She and and particularly with Princess Margaret when she came along four years later. The two princesses dressed identically. You see them at Silver Jubilee service of George V and things like this, and, and they were very, very popular. Okay. It's interesting that um, only days after uh, Princess Elizabeth was born, before she even had a name, um, her grandmother, Queen Mary, via a lady-in-waiting, writes a letter to a friend. Uh, in the letter, she says how happy she is at this first royal grandchild. Okay, so say Princess Elizabeth is the first royal grandchild of George V and Queen Mary, and that accounts for prominence from the very beginning of her life. But what Queen Mary says is, mercifully, in this case, the sex it doesn't matter, of course, because this little baby is the child of a second son, and there is no anticipation that the second son will become king, and therefore no anticipation that any of his children will be queen. Having said that, because of this prominence from birth, there are people who talk about the little princess as a likely second, uh, next sovereign. So my understanding would be that though um, the Queen's parents shielded her from this sort of thing, there must have been something, something that surrounded her, that, that perhaps when this finally happened made it not so surprising. Uh, Princess Elizabeth wasn't formally educated as we would understand it and, and even during her own childhood there were occasional protests at the lightness of the educational programme that, that, that was, was provided for her. But her mother um, very firmly felt that one of the outcomes of childhood should be what she described as a store, a sort of kernel, if you like, of happy memories which would provide one with, with, with resources um, against potential bad times ahead. And, and, and goodness, um, you know, how useful that, that, that must have proved to, to the future queen.
but um, I didn't think that she had any particular expectation. What was rather interesting was that um, she did spend every April with her grandparents, George V and Queen Mary at Windsor, very often left there by her, her parents, and, and um, that was a very nice relationship. So I, what I'm trying to say is it's a kind of very much a family situation until 1936. This is London. The following bulletin was issued at 9.25. The King's life is moving peacefully towards its close. God to call to his mercy our late sovereign lord King George the fifth well the first thing that happened in 1936 of course was the death of George the fifth and the Queen as a little girl witnessed um, the procession of the for the funeral and also was um, in St George's Chapel watching the proceedings so then after that she has Edward the eighth her uncle who is unmarried uh, um, Mrs. Simpson is around. Nobody's particularly concerned about it because Mr. Simpson is also around. But the moment that um, Mrs. Simpson institutes divorce proceedings against her husband, um, they all begin to get worried. King Edward VIII, the world's most famous bachelor, has often been a best man, but never a bridegroom. At the wedding of the Duke of Kent, King Edward seemed pleased to see his youngest brother march to the altar, but his own wedding march has yet to be written. Today, the American press is filled with rumors of royal romance, of the possibility of King Edward marrying Mrs. Wallace Simpson, the former Baltimore Belle. Yesterday, as a girl, she lived in Maryland in this quiet and humble Baltimore home. Tomorrow, she may dwell in Buckingham Palace, King Edward and Mrs. Simpson have been pictured together on many occasions. And in this topsy-turvy world, it may be time for an American woman to marry a British king. Only one man knows the answer, and as yet, he is keeping it a royal secret. But no one expected Edward VIII to abdicate at all, and, and the family didn't realize what was going on until literally a few days before it actually happened and it dawned on you know the Duke of York that he was going to have to take over. So there comes a moment when he abdicates and he disappears and um, at that point the young princess, they were living in uh, you know right next to Apsley House 145 Piccadilly, she comes down she sees an envelope on the hall table addressed Her Majesty the Queen. That's mummy now she says you know she realizes and of course that she is therefore um, going to, in the fullness of time, take over because although they could have had a, another child, it wasn't very likely. I mean, had, had they had another child and had he been a boy, of course, he would have taken precedence over her, but that actually wasn't going to happen. And so the crisis dragged its length until at last, over the radio, a king made a statement telling of an issue already decided. At, at long last, I am able to say a few words of my own. I have never wanted to withhold anything, but until now it has not been constitutionally possible for me to speak. You all know the reasons which have, have impelled me to renounce the throne, but you must believe me when I tell you that I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And now we all have a new king. I wish him and you, his people, happiness and prosperity with all my heart. 
God bless you all. God save the king. Well, I think it was huge. First of all, of course, they had to immediately move house. They moved into Buckingham Palace, Windsor Castle. They spent Christmas at Sandringham. They were the king and queen. Um, Balmoral was theirs as well. Um, shortly after that was the coronation, and the young princesses both took part in that, and that would have given a very, very clear indication of the enormity of what had been taken on. So I think it was a huge shock for them. As I say, totally unexpected. No one really up to the last minute thought that Edward VIII would actually abdicate. Um, nobody abdicated. I mean, James II was the last time that that had vaguely happened. It just wasn't done, and yet it happened. And so they were left to pick up the pieces. I mean, the interesting thing is that, of course, um, George VI and Queen Elizabeth were very nervous and worried um, that the British public uh, wouldn't um, like them particularly or admire them or want them. And Edward VIII had been such a charismatic figure. But they actually, they, they had many more strengths than they realized. They had this very good family unit. And actually, that, in a way, what you could call a sort of Sunday lunch, walk in the park, afternoon tea sort of monarchy, appealed very much more to the British public than the sort of brittle cocktail shaker, late night world of Edward and Mrs. Simpson. Well, I think the abdication was a huge seismic shock for the country and for the family. It was a sort of public humiliation, this idea the family couldn't start, step up and do their duty. But I think also it was a sense that this monarchy, which was uh, uh, this divine right to rule almost, had in a sense been shattered. Uh, and of course it destroyed the family because Bertie had to step up. It wasn't prepared for it. Uh, he was not, in terms of his character, really the sort of person who they thought would, would, would suit being a king. Uh, he had a young family. Uh, the Queen Mother always thought that it led to an early death, the pressures of, of being king. Uh, and of course it destroyed the family life that they had. We four, they talked about, and that ended. In February 1936, a magazine called The Sphere told its readers that um, it was a fairly long odds chance that Princess Elizabeth would ever sit on Britain's throne. Fast forward 10 months to December 1936, and of course those odds shorten dramatically with the abdication of Elizabeth's uncle, um, uh, the, the, the former Prince of Wales, Edward VIII, and suddenly her father is king, and um, uh, Princess Elizabeth becomes heiress presumptive. Now at the time, her mother is only um, uh, approaching 37, perfectly possible that um, uh, Queen Elizabeth w would have another child, um, but I don't think anybody um, in the know and anybody connected with that family intimately actually realistically anticipated that happening. So from the abdication of Edward VIII onwards, it seems pretty certain that Princess Elizabeth will be the, with the sovereign after her father. Well, the myth which continues to this day is that Duke of Windsor gave up his throne for the woman he loved. I don't think that's quite the story. He was manoeuvred off the throne uh, by courtiers who saw him as to totally unsuitable. In fact, they had encouraged all the most dangerous sports, including steeplechasing, in the hope he would die. And that would solve their problems. Uh, and they really used Wallace on the scene to move, move him out. Uh, and I think there was a feeling of shame in the family, a, sh uh, a sense that he uh, had let them all down. Uh, but he was a very weak man. He was a man without a great sense of public duty, without a great deal of intelligence, but also someone who wanted to interfere beyond his constitutional role and particularly was drawn to the Nazis. Uh, he had several German cousins who were Nazi generals. He was targeted by the Nazis throughout the 1930s. And there was a real concern in government circles that not only was he indiscreet, but he was also an patriotic. He was drawn into the circles of a number of German uh, agents, of which the first, almost immediately after he abdicated, was a man called Charles Beddoe. Charles Beddoe was a Franco-American businessman who'd made his money from time and motion studies, had huge business interests in Germany, was keen to um, stabilize those interests and, and, and keep on the right side of the Nazis. And the deal was done that in return for basically a free wedding, uh, the Duke would make this tour of Germany organized by Bedo and various Nazi officials. Uh, and the Duke did this for several reasons. One was he wanted to show off to his wife. He wanted to give her the sort of royal tour which he realized she would no, no longer have. I think he also felt that um, 
the Nazis were doing a good job uh, and what they were doing there was interesting. Uh, he believed in the Fuhrer principle, but I think also it was just a way of getting back at his brother. There was a lot of personal animosity that went on. Uh, the royal family felt that they'd let them, they'd been let down. He'd actually hidden the amount of wealth that he'd sequestered away during his time as Prince of Wales, and then wanted more money after he abdicated. And I think he felt um, with his brother that he had that he could still be king and boss him around. When the Duke of Windsor um, abdicated, the, the, the line was that he should get out of Britain, go into exile, not in any way upstage his brother, let him settle in. There was also concern that the Duke of Windsor had a lot of support from Mosleyites, the black shirts, uh, and that was another reason to keep him out. Uh, and the idea was to basically let Bertie breathe, let him establish himself uh, without the distraction of, of his brother. Now, unfortunately, Duke of Windsor didn't play by all those rules. He made these tours of places like Germany. He had another tour planned for America at the end of 1937. He made statements in the press. He was constantly uh, an irritant when what they wanted him to do was to go away and keep quiet. Uh, I think the abdication really affected the Queen. Uh, uh, this had been her favourite uncle. Uh, uh, this was not the role she expected in life. She saw her own family life uh, changed forever. And I think, as she said when she was 21, I will denote, devote the whole of my life to the service of my country. There was a sense that they needed to get back to that George V line of the royal family being, in a sense, the, the, the father and mother of the nation, and a life of public service, charitable activity, probity in their private lives. Uh, and this aberration, in some ways, of, of, of the Duke of Windsor had to be stamped out and to show people that I mean, they'd seen many of the monarchies fall after the First World War. And the last thing they wanted was to be vulnerable um, because of the behavior of the Duke of Windsor. Edward VIII, you know, gave up reigning over two thirds of the world's population, or whatever it was, you know, and 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 took the path of perceived happiness. I sometimes show an image of of um, the Duke of Windsor at the age of seventy, with dead eyes, looking up, absolutely utterly miserable, and juxtapose it with a picture of the Queen at the age of eighty-eight, at the state opening of Parliament, with sparkling eyes because she's done her bit. Um, yes, it was a problem, but actually, to be fair to Edward VIII, he did. He went quietly because I think he wanted to go. He didn't want to stay. He didn't fight his corner particularly. And I think he did actually abdicate as honorably as that is possible to do. He behaved quite badly after that because having gone away, in a sense, he wanted to come back again and reinvent himself as a younger brother of the sovereign on his own terms. And he realized, you know, death by a thousand cuts, that that wasn't going to happen. He had let people down and they weren't going to forget it. So the family dynamic must have been quite complicated because they were all quite fond of Edward VIII. I mean, he was a very, you know, as I say, he was a very charismatic character and the Queen was very fond of him when she was a little girl, you know. Um, but he'd gone. That was it. It seems that um, central to the Queen's character is a sort of pragmatism. There is an acceptingness that she, she isn't somebody who fights against inevitabilities. Uh, uh, and one gets a sense, looking at the sources, that um, the, the moment that you know, life tilts on its axis, um, that, that little girl just accepted the altered reality. Um, there are uh, conscious efforts to prepare her for what's coming. Um, from 1940 onwards, for example, um, uh, the then Queen, Queen Elizabeth, later the Queen Mother, takes her two daughters on hospital visits. Um, in 1942, um, Princess Elizabeth begins independent um, royal engagements on her own. Her, her first one, when as Colonel's Grenadier Guard, she, she, she reviews um, the Grenadiers. Princess Elizabeth celebrates her 16th birthday by inspecting, as their new Colonel, the Grenadier Guards at a special parade at Windsor Castle. The occasion also marks her entry into the official life of the nation. Her Royal Highness the Colonel walks to the long ranks of guardsmen, followed by the King and Queen and Princess Margaret. Wearing the gold grenade badge of the Grenadiers in her hat, Princess Elizabeth makes her first military inspection. And of course, 
um, there's a programme of um, uh, constitutional history and indeed history lessons with the Vice Provost of Eton, Henry Martin, who is a, a friend of um, Princess Elizabeth's great aunt, uh, uh, Princess Alice, Countess of Athlone. I am speaking to you now from Buckingham Palace with its honourable staff. The Queen and I have seen many of the places here which have been most heavily bombed and many of the people who have suffered and are suffering most. Our hearts are with them tonight. Well, the, the, any preparation for Princess Elizabeth was very much interrupted by the war. Of course, you know, since George VI had a pretty horrible reign, because first of all, he's propelled onto the throne. He doesn't know whether he can cope. He has that stammer. You know, he has to do all those things. Um, then there's the war clouds and there's also the Duke of Windsor behaving badly in Europe and he's worrying about all that. Then comes the war for between 1940 and 1945 and it's not very long after that that his health breaks down. But I think it's fair to say that the King and Queen were much more preoccupied with the war effort than they were with the education of the children and I know that Princess Margaret very much resented that. But um, on the other hand, having said that, she was able to um, observe her father at work and, and see, see what he did and see how he did, indeed see how her mother did things. Mes chers amis, je viens au nom des enfants de mon pays vous remercier des magnifiques cadeaux que vous leur avez donnés au moment des fêtes de Noël. J'espère que vous êtes tous à l'écoute pour m'entendre dire combien nous avons été touchés de votre joli geste et de votre générosité. She was given constitutional education by Sir Henry Martin, and actually, uh, who, was the, who was the Provost of Eton, so very close to Windsor Castle where they were spending the war. And Queen Mary took quite a strong interest in her education, feeling very much that it was being neglected by the Queen Mother. And she made sure that people like Sir Owen Morshead, the librarian, would show the princesses around the the Royal Library, that Canon Dalton or whoever it was would take them round St George's Chapel, that they got to know things learnt about the pictures and things like that, so to, in order to try to sort of give them a better sort of education, because the Queen Mother, you know, her philosophy of life was very much all things bright and beautiful, you know, as long as everybody was happy, um, it didn't really matter too much, and Queen Mary, I think, quite rightly thought that wasn't enough. Yes, I think there was a very firm family bond, and, and it's interesting because it arose for two reasons. One is to do with the happiness of the marriage of the Duke and Duchess of York, uh, and also this overtly loving nature of the Duchess of York, the future um, Queen Elizabeth, the Queen Mother. Um, the other is, of course, that um, as a couple, the Yorks very skillfully promoted the Duke of York as a family man, and this was partly compensatory. Um, the Duke of York was not an accomplished public performer in the way of his, his brother, the Prince of Wales, the future Edward VIII. Um, he had a terrible stammer, people felt that he was um, physically rather fragile. And so because he, he, he didn't have the star qualities of his brother, what he did have, which his brother didn't have, were, were these solid domestic virtues. And so um, always, uh, as a couple, there is mention of their, of their family role. But, but I think that was wholly sincere as well. And when we look at the kind of iconography of them, it, it's photographs taken by Marcus Adams, Lisa Sheridan, that promote them as an ideal family. And I think for them, they were an ideal family. I think it was an intensely loving, supportive, nurturing environment, um, which gave the Queen many long-term benefits. example of both of her parents during those war years really moulded the Queen. Because we all think of her as following in her father's footsteps, which indeed in every sense she has, you know, that sense of duty above all. But perhaps from the Queen Mother, the young, younger Elizabeth, Princess Elizabeth, she saw something of, of how just being there on the ground was so important. Queen Elizabeth 
the second would later say famously that she had to be seen to be believed and perhaps she got something of that from her mother now she could she couldn't imitate her mother's very fluffy feminine warm style both because of her own temperament and perhaps because it's not so appropriate for a, a, a reigning queen a queen regnant rather than a queen consort in a sense Elizabeth II had to be both King George and his wife, the Queen Mother. Great crowds defied the wintry weather to bid farewell to their majesties and the princesses on the eve of their historic journey. The South Africa trip of 1947 was important in several different ways. Famously after the war, the king had said that, you know, he wanted his daughters, poor, poor girls, they've never had any fun. And of course it is true, they had, in a sense, even more than the rest of the nation, led this quite sequestered life um, at, at Windsor Castle, with only, I think, a company of the Grenadier Guards for, you know, for company. But also, of course, they'd never been beyond British shores because of the, the, their, the, their growing up was done in the war years. So on the one hand, it was a chance for them to see a little bit of the rest of the world, to have that fun. And famously, there'd be those pictures from the deck of the ship of the princesses playing tag with the young officers and so on. But also, it came at a very important time, both in the life of the Princess Elizabeth and in the life of the, the wider royal family, if you like, the, the declining empire. On the one hand, we know that Princess Elizabeth had long set her heart on her kinsman, Prince Philip. On the other, there were some, some doubts in the royal family about this. Now, in fact, almost certainly in the summer of 46 at Balmoral, Philip had asked Elizabeth to marry him, and she had agreed, subject, of course, to her father's consent. But her parents asked her to wait, wait till after the South Africa tour. Perhaps they thought she was just too young. There was a little concern that Philip, you know, that she hadn't met enough people. There was a little concern that Philip was perhaps slightly raffish, perhaps, you know, slightly domineering. His certainly very dominant uncle, Lord Mountbatten, was a concern. But also the trip was important because obviously in the, those, those days after the end of the Second World War, the, the old British Empire was on the way out. You know, large parts of it had already crumbled. It was clear that, you know, more was, was to happen. In its place, there could perhaps be, and Queen Elizabeth II would be massively committed to this, a new kind of family of nations, as she said, the Commonwealth. It was, of course, on that trip that Princess Elizabeth turned 21, a huge landmark. And so it was from South Africa that she made that enormously famous and significant speech. There is a motto which has been borne by many of my ancestors, a noble motto, I serve. Those words were an inspiration to many bygone heirs to the throne when they made their nightly dedication as they came to manhood. I cannot quite do as they did, but through the inventions of science, I can do what was not possible for any of them. I can make my solemn act of dedication with the whole empire listening. I should like to make that dedication now. It is very simple. I declare before you all that my whole life, whether it be long or short, shall be devoted to your service and to the service of our great imperial family to which we all belong. Now, she clearly took that as a vow. She obviously meant every word. The princess came of age in, sev in, in several different ways 
on that tour. Uh, courtiers were sort of seeing her really act in public, you know, for almost the first time. They noted with great approval her sense of duty and her passion for timekeeping, the way she'd prod her mother with her, with her umbrella discreetly if she felt that we, they were getting too far behind the schedule. So in, in a number of ways, I think, that trip showed Elizabeth coming of age, not only as a princess and future queen, but as a kind of working operative, as someone with her own ideas and ideals of what monarchy should be. The Queen, um, uh, as Princess Elizabeth, um, probably first met her future husband, Prince Philip, at the marriage of his aunt and her uncle, Princess Marina of Greece and, and Prince George, Duke of Kent, in 1934. But, but really the great meeting comes um, in 1939 at the Royal Naval College Dartmouth when, when Princess Elizabeth is 13 and, and Prince Philip of Greece is 18. Um, having said that, two years earlier, um, a magazine in, in January 1937 published a list of prospective future husbands for Princess Elizabeth, which did actually include Prince Philip of Greece. Um, in 1958, um, as Queen, uh, the Queen signed off um, an official life of her father, George VI, in which the writer claimed that um, Princess Elizabeth fell in love with Prince Philip from their first meeting and the Queen allowed that to pass and I think she is fundamentally a very honest person and the fact that she allowed that would suggest that that was indeed the case. So whatever plans had or hadn't been made for her by her parents, her grandparents, actually um, there was this great coup de foudre for, uh, for the young teenage princess and then, and then fate took its course. There seems to have been um, no plan on the part of, of the Queen's parents that she should marry um, the, 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 this child of, a, of, a, of an exiled European royal family. Um, uh, certainly uh, the King's assistant private secretary uh, 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 felt that um, the, the Queen, the Queen uh, whom we remember as the Queen Mother, would have been much happier had the Queen formed an alliance with, with, with a man of aristocratic background much like her own. And, and, and the three key candidates appear to have been the future um, Dukes of uh, Buccleuch, Grafton and Northumberland. But, you know, by the time um, those young men were manoeuvred into the royal sphere, I, I think the princess had made up her own mind. And certainly when she was 15, she told a friend that Philip was the boy for her. I'm interested that when um, uh, Princess Elizabeth and, and, and Prince Philip were engaged, um, a, a, a private secretary said that what they did was they united two slightly different concepts of monarchy that the Queen had inherited what he described as a semi-divine idea of monarchy uh, and Prince Philip um, embodied a sort of hail, f uh, you know, hail fellow well met idea of monarchy and, and that the two were incredibly powerful as a cocktail because the, the Queen's understanding of this, um, the, 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 this sort of special aura of monarchy has of course kept her slightly um, remote from, from the popular fray. Um, whilst Prince Philip tempered that and, and gave a sense of accessibility. Um, I, I think the fact that theirs was such a strong partnership meant that there could be um, creative thinking about how to do things. I think also it partly contributed to the fact that the Queen it really does appear to have enjoyed being Queen and to have enjoyed being Queen almost every day. And, and, and I think that is in, in, in large measure to do with this astonishing support she got from her husband, the amount of public work that they did together, and their shared belief in the royal mission. November the 20th, 1947, and London's background of Mr. Grey became the setting of the greatest royal event the capital has seen since the coronation. Tremendous crowds assembled near the palace, thrilled again to a half-forgotten but once familiar spectacle the troops of the household cavalry in all the glory of full dress. The poet laureate John Macefield um, uh, wrote at the time of the Queen's wedding, a, a, a crown shines when hope is dim and luck is out of joint. And of course much of the Queen's reign has um, been characterised by economic hardship. Um, and throughout the crises, it seems to me, in our national life, um, we have continued to look towards um, the monarchy and in particular look towards the Queen and that, that has been the case throughout her, her very long reign. Well, Duke of Edinburgh, extraordinary figure, um, he was not welcomed into the royal household by the courtiers, particularly not the stuffier 
friends of the Queen Mother who were very suspicious of him and very disparaging to him. You know, when he first arrived at Windsor Castle, some courtier said to him, oh, we think you'll rather like Windsor Castle when you get to know it. And he was able to say, thank you very much, my mother was born here, as indeed she had been. And the very presence of Queen Victoria in 1885. But um, I think that what you'd say about Prince Philip is that given the situation in which he found himself, he, he, he made it his own. He, he worked out a good system. He worked out that his prime duty was to support the Queen, but that he wouldn't be needed to do that the whole time. Therefore, when he's supporting the Queen, that's what he's doing, and when he wasn't, then he could pursue all the many, many other endeavours that he did. And he was a very robust figure. I never thought that it was a problem him walking two steps behind the Queen. Um, he had been brought up as a minor member of the Greek royal family. He, he, knew, he knew the system. He knew perfectly well what he was getting into. And that's what you do. Uh, in fact, he would then turn that to his advantage as well, because the Queen was, naturally has to be quite careful about what she says, and he wasn't careful what he said at all. And he would try to get a rise out of people, try to have a joke with them. It didn't always work. Um, sometimes he upset people, but um, you know, I think by and large, people realise, you know, what he was up to. Um, and he liked an argument, but he didn't like people agreeing with him. And I, the more I think about it. It's only by arguing with people that you get to a consensus. You were, he was perfectly willing to lose the argument, but he wanted to hear what it was. Well, I think he had an extraordinary brain. It was a, you know, if I said it was a military brain, he would snap my head off and say, "Well, it's a naval brain." But it's the same thing, really. It's like you, you know, you you, you look at all, you don't come out from under your cover until you've worked out possibilities of A, B, C, D, and he, so he had a very logical brain, and and so he applied that to different situations. And one example, which is actually rather interesting, has become almost more interesting as the years have gone by, is that the night before the Princess of Wales's funeral, Prince William, Prince Harry was sort of fed up with the press, under, un understandably, and were not at all sure that they wanted to walk behind their mother's coffin. And he said, I think when you're older, you'd regret it if you don't walk behind your mother's coffin, and I will walk with you. And since then, unfortunately, they have actually both pretty much said that they don't think they should have been made to do that. But I, I think he, he was right, because if they'd behaved in a petulant way and sort of stayed at home or, I don't know, it, it, it never works. You kind of, you, you grow by doing your bit. And it may have been ghastly. I'm sure it was ghastly. The whole thing was ghastly. But actually, if you rise to the occasion, you know, you get something out of it. And he's, you've paid respect to your mother. You know, I think it's very important. That's the sort of thing he thought of, you know. Well, I think that the monarchy of George VI and Queen Elizabeth had been a very domestic family sort of monarchy, a family at the heart of the nation. And of course, the um, Queen had married very young. She was only 21 when she married Prince Philip. And the two children, Prince Charles, Princess Anne, had appeared. They had had nice time out in Malta. And they were really expecting that they could continue like that for some time. And then, of course, the King became desperately ill. And so the Queen her uh, trip to Canada in 1951 was postponed and then when she did go to Canada she was inevitably taking black clothes and proclamation material with her, uh, which luckily wasn't needed. But then, when, of course, as you, as you know, when she went off on that long Commonwealth tour, or meant to be long Commonwealth tour, um, you see the King forlornly looking, saying goodbye to her. You must have wondered whether they'd see each other, although I don't suppose they thought he was going to die at exactly that moment, otherwise I don't think she would have gone. But having said that, when they came back, there was a, a little tiny element of excitement that they could, she and Prince Philip could do things in a new way. Um, he was, of course, a great modernizer and full of ideas, but it took time. There were a lot of people much older than them controlling things, and so they were to some extent, you know, particularly if I'm thinking of the coronation where Prince Philip had various ideas which were very much squashed by the Archbishop of Canterbury and the Duke of Norfolk. But I think that after that, um, the things that were key and important to the Queen was this whole sort of transition of empire to Commonwealth and, and the Commonwealth being a family of nations that got together voluntarily. I and mean, that's one of, been her, one of the key things that she's done.
And the queen, the great ceremony over, having withdrawn into the chapel of St. Edward the Confessor, returns to pass in procession through the choir and the nave, and so out of the abbey into the London which waits to receive her. understanding is that um, when Princess Elizabeth um, became queen in 1952, she didn't formulate a plan for monarchy, that her focus was fidelity to the example of her father and her grandfather. You know, she was um, devoted to her father. She greatly admired both her father and her grandfather. Uh, and it seems to me that her aim was to perpetuate their model of monarchy, their successful model of monarchy in the first half of the 20th century. Interesting because um, uh, younger viewers who don't remember the 1950s, but who perhaps remember um, the popularity of Diana, Princess of Wales, or, or subsequent popularity of um, uh, Duke and Duchess of Cambridge, or um, the Duke and Duchess of Sussex, um, may not realise that, that actually that level of adulation, indeed greater level of adulation, was accorded to the Queen and Prince Philip in the 1950s. There's an extraordinary quote about when they arrive in um, New Zealand on that great post-coronation Commonwealth tour that it's like the second coming. A a and this is said without irony because so many people turn out and, and, and the feeling is one of such um, intense emotion. So the 1950s, certainly the first half of the 1950s, was an, a period of extraordinary um, buoyancy for the royal couple. And of course, that level of adulation never lasts, and indeed, it, it, it didn't last. But um, there seems to have been a decision, in fact, in fact, Prince Philip referred to this, a decision not to play to that kind of feeling, but to recognize it, its possible evanescence, and instead work on um, you know, developing longer, sustainable bonds of um, affection between um, sovereign and people. I think the Queen um, absorbs a concept of the potential fragility of monarchy in the aftermath of the abdication. Um, it is almost certainly the case that um, neither her grandparents, or well, her, her grandmother, her grandfather having died, uh, nor her parents particularly spoke to her about their own feelings about what Edward VIII had done at that particular moment. But she must have um, absorbed um, the idea that this had put the family in crisis. It had, after all, altered both her own destiny and, and that of her parents, who were reluctant um, sovereigns in the first instance. And of course, by the time the Queen becomes king, it's, it, it becomes queen. It's only 16 years after the abdication, and you know, a sense that George VI had really concentrated very hard on steadying the ship, um, but that the ship could become unsteady potentially. Um, so I think the Queen um, possibly uh, that there is always this, uh, early on this slight sense of nervousness that this is more fragile as an institution than, than certainly we we may subsequently feel. I think the family thing was very important and if you look at the photographs you'll see lots of pictures of them sitting at Balmoral, you know, Prince Philip and the Queen and the two, the first two children and, and so forth and then of course, you know, later on come the, the second two children um, which was I think easier for her because by then she was more assured as a, as a sort of, as a working monarch if you like. 
uh, since the 1960s, every institution in Britain associated with authority, um, parliament and politicians, um, the church, police and the judiciary, you know, uh, e even teachers, have all been downgraded in terms of the respect that the average person pays to them. And yet the crown has suffered no um, similar diminution of respect. And uh, you know, that, that is um, the, the Queen's achievement, and it is a remarkable achievement. Um, I'm also um, mindful of a quote in the Zambia Daily Mail in 1979 when the newspaper referred to the loving heart of the Queen. Now, at the time, it was making a point against Mrs Thatcher and it was comparing these, these, these two women, this very tough Prime Minister uh, uh, and a rather softer um, sovereign. But that sense that I think we, we have that the Queen loves this country, that she loves the Commonwealth, that she loves the people of this country and the Commonwealth, that she loves her duty towards them, um, is a wonderfully powerful thing and, and of course keeps her you know, at the heart of our national life, within our national affection, perpetuating a relationship that people have commented on in the past. So for example, one of um, Prince Philip's uncles, Prince Christopher of Greece in 1938, wrote about the, the, the loving relationship between Crown and people in Britain, which he identified as a uniquely British thing. And of course, part of what the Queen has done is to sustain that bond of affection. It was always said, wasn't it, famous have been the ages of our queens, that Britain likes queens. And indeed, over the last 200 years, for about 140 of them, it's been a woman on the throne. Now, that has probably done a good deal to shape our present view of monarchy. And I think, in many ways, it's been extremely good for the monarchy. Because if you think about what a king and a queen are supposed to be, well, what was it, Wordsworth? The ideal woman was, is what? To warn, to comfort, to command. Well, that's pretty much what Queen Elizabeth II does in those weekly audiences with the prime ministers. A queen, traditionally, has supposed to be, you know, gracious, smiling, intercessionary, you know, a figure of kind of peace and comfort. That works with our modern idea of a constitutional monarchy. A king, historically, is supposed to be, well, forceful, commanding, scary in a good way. And that really doesn't play so well for the late 20th, let alone the 21st century. I think in some ways it's unfortunate for the monarchy that it looks as if the next three incumbents of the throne will all be male, even if perhaps, you know, ideas of masculinity are changing and ideas of monarchy with it. It was Prince Albert and Queen Victoria who rewrote the image of the monarchy, if you like, to make it very much an influence on the royal family. The idea was that the royal family was meant to embody the best of every family in Britain. Now that works very well with having a woman on the throne because, again, historically, traditionally, that's where women's place has been. Men have been supposed to be out there, leading armies into battles, making speeches before Agincourt. And so, in one way, this emphasis on family is, has be, be, become a great blessing for the monarchy. In another way, of course, it's a trap. Because when the family, this royal family, starts to look rather less like an idealised reflection of family life, and heaven knows that's happened enough over the last decades, then it, it risks really throwing into question the whole reason for the monarchy. Group Captain Peter Woolridge Townsend, CVO, DSO, DFC and Bar, mentioned in dispatches, former equerry to Her Majesty. But he is also the man the world has been talking about more and more over the past two years. 
Seldom can a man have been so widely discussed without being able to say a word. Quite early in her reign, the Queen had to deal with one of those huge traps implicit on the emphasis of the royal family and the morality of the royal family in the shape of her sister Margaret's relationship with group Captain Townsend, a divorced man. This Margaret situation, which is that she wanted to, or appeared to want to marry group Captain Peter Townsend, who um, was, um, yeah, been a Battle of Britain pilot, highly decorated, uh, um, everything about him in a way perfect, except for the fact that he was married with two boys. And as Lassell's, Tommy Lassell said to him, you know, it's not as though you're a, a teenager, you know, you're a man in, considerably older than the princess, you were put into a position of responsibility and, you know, and you have a wife and two sons, you know, I mean, in a way, I mean, he was a very nice man, Peter Townsend, I knew, I knew him quite well, but he, you know, essentially broke the rules because, you know, you've got to be careful in those sort of positions. And so the, the, the issue was, you know, what Princess Margaret was very much cast adrift after her father died. I mean, he adored, the king adored Princess Margaret. And so she then had to go and live with her mother at Clarence House, which wasn't a great success. And, um, you know, she was then a guest in the houses where she'd been brought up. And Peter Townsend was very much like the son that the king hadn't had. The queen mother wanted him as master of her household. Um, he was sort of in between the ages of the queen mother and Princess Margaret. And you could see very easily she fell for him, and particularly in the, her lonely state. But um, the Queen's problem was, of course, that as head of the Church of England, she couldn't condone the marriage you know, to a divorced man in that way, whereas she wanted her sister to be happy, and they all liked Peter Townsend. But I think what Lassell's did was actually very clever. Um, he sent him away for two years, and my theory, based on a lot of reading, I may tell you, is that by the time that he came back, um, it was over. I mean, they, they'd got over it. And I do know that Princess Margaret felt that the British public had taken such a keen interest in this that she needed to say something. So that's why you've got all those statements about mindful of, you know, um, Christian teaching and public duty, etc. that she was not going to marry Peter Townsend. But the Queen did not forbid Princess Margaret to marry um, Townsend at all. That's, that's, that's a myth. Um, of course, um, made worse by that ridiculous series, The Crown which likes to twist everything around to its own advantage. Um, but Princess Margaret wouldn't have been able probably to have retained, I mean, she might have been able to retain her title. She probably wouldn't have retained her civil list um, allocation. She might have had to move into, into private life. But I think the whole thing was over by then anyway. So it was kind of a, it's, very compl it's a very complicated saga, but it must have been very difficult for the Queen, certainly. The Princess Margaret Peter Townsend situation was extremely difficult for a very young queen because she'd always been protective of her sister. Her father had always been very conscious that one would be queen, one wouldn't, uh, but that should not be made apparent to them. But here the queen had this dilemma. It was an and a very notable instance of the Queen having to choose between her role as head of state, with everything that implies about, you know, the, the views of the Church of England on divorce, and her role as a loving sister, the family and the firm. Basically, she chose the firm, as she always would do. The palace turned to television to help the public to get to know their queen. For the first time, cameras were given special access for a whole year. The film Royal Family was a phenomenon. Terribly rude words. It is extremely difficult sometimes to keep a straight face. When the Home Secretary said to me, there's a, there's a gorilla coming in. So I said, you know, what an extraordinary remark to make, very unkind about it anybody and uh, so you know i stood in the middle of the room and pressed the bell and the doors opened and there was a grandma <laughs> and i had the most terrible trouble in keeping you know he had short body long arms and, <laughs> and i had the most appalling trouble we're very worried that sort of 
way that the Queen and Prince Philip, but mainly the Queen, were, were the sort of people they appeared to be on television. It wasn't at all what they were really like. And, um, you know, they, they, they appeared rather wooden and not very amusing, and their sense of humour never came over. And, and it did strike me what a pity this was, because, you know, they, aren't, they simply weren't like that. And that's why originally I suggested uh, to Prince Philip and then later to the Queen that uh, what about having a, a film made? Well, of course, the crew were apprehensive. You know, we didn't know what to expect and not in fear and trembling, but we're, we're quite, you know, not worried about it either. But it must have been on the Queen's side as well because up to then she had never experienced anything like that with, you know, film crews tramping around the palace or a film crew. So. It must have been quite a unique experience for her as well. Suddenly, uh, the Queen found herself there with, a, with, a, with a, uh, a microphone just a couple of inches above her head, which came as a considerable shock to her. Uh, and she did take a bit of time to get used to that. I think that concerned her, but very, very, very short time. She was, she, she was very professional at it. <laughs> She made us feel at ease, that's the thing. Each member of the crew was spoken to individually and, uh, you know, she had a seat out of her hand. The informal scenes of royal family were done at the drop of a hat. I remember, for instance, being in Sandringham when it suddenly snowed. We thought, what a good idea, we'll film a snowball fight. And out came the two young princes. I remember Prince Andrew being a bit miffed at the thought that Prince Edward's pile of balls was much bigger than his. I came, gave him a hand, and I ended up having a real old battle royal. <laughs> we went back again to do a Christmas broadcast, and of course the Queen came into the room and she said, I hope you gentlemen all received your photographs. So the, all the chaps, Edwards and that, said, yes, yes, thank you very much. I said, well, you do realise you've put us in a very embarrassing position by sending us those photographs. So the Queen said, uh, why is that, Mr Gorringe? I said, well, uh, all the chaps have been queuing up at Harrods to buy grand pianos to put them on. <laughs> the media, the role of the media is a very complicated one in this thing, and particularly, of course, when it comes to thinking about the royal family film in 1969 which um, popped up on YouTube again recently, and actually I was very keen to suggest that they should just release it since we can now see it, and the, the real people, and, and getting on well with each other. I mean, and, and I think they had to do it. I don't think they could have remained too remote, but people always say that that's what opened the sort of floodgates, and of course, to some extent, turned it into a sort of soap opera and this whole sort of celebrity culture that then followed. It was Prince Philip, the moderniser, who said that in some way, you know, who in some ways urged more access for the media. He was one of the chief voices behind that fly on the wall documentary, Royal Family, got unprecedented coverage. And in a sense, then the genie was out of the bottle. I mean, when he saw Royal Family, David Attenborough, then one of the controllers of the BBC said, this is the end of the monarchy. It re the, the, there really was a feeling that they were playing a very dangerous game. And I think they knew it because Royal Family, after its enormously successful uh, viewings, was put back in the box and has never been seen in its entirety since. I think the problem with the Royal Family is that we want the mystique, we want the dignity, but we also want to insights into their life. We want to know about them. And I think Kate and William get, this, get the balance absolutely right. Somehow they seem very approachable without being uh, um, giving away too much. Duchess of York, I would say, is a, another extreme, um, uh, where she's far too familiar, or was when she was Duchess of York. But the, um, I don't think the 69 film is, is quite as bad as everyone thought. I think it got to the point where there had to be some light shown on the monarchy. It couldn't. Society was changing. I mean, think we'd just gone through the 1960s. People expected to know more about uh, the monarchy. Uh, and I think it was a very brave and sensible thing to do. I, I think we must remember that the royal family film in 1969 was a huge success. 
and, and regarded as such by almost everybody, both the royal family themselves, um, I- including the Queen, who initially had been reluctant um, to, 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 to take part in this, but also by the public. You know, there, there are accounts of water shortages in the capital um, the, the night that it's first screened, because so many people go to the loo when, it, when it's over, because they have sat to, to, to watch this extraordinary film. Um, the late 60s were a difficult time for the royal family. There, there was much criticism that, that the Queen had become a middle-aged figure. She seemed um, out of sync with, with a very youth-driven culture of the 1960s. It, it was a culture that was protesting against um, inherited orthodoxies, um, uh, any sort of idea of respect and deference to. The Queen was in a very difficult position. And, and the royal family film did act as a very positive corrective was called Royal Family, but the undoubted star of the film is the Queen, and people's comments after the film were what a nice person she was. Um, and perhaps at a loftier level, an understanding now of what she did, what, 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 the, what the royal role was. And of course the media changed massively. I mean, when she came to the throne, um, the Press Association correspondent came to a, a briefing with you know, my predecessors, but three or four, after the after the war, came in in a tail, you know, black coat and tails for a briefing, and in a bowler hat and all the rest of it. So initially, it was really only the print media, and then of course the coronation spurred television hugely. Radio had been important during the war, but television was very much a feature of this new reign of the Queen. And so I think the the media formed a more important influencer within our society. And then, of course, you know, much later on into her reign, a very vigorous tabloid media, the entertainment media, the celebrity media, and all that kind of touched slightly on the monarchy. So that, that, that did change. But in terms of the way the Queen did her job, and I think you know, many other members of the royal family, it was just a component in our society. You know, in, in our childhoods, maybe 40, 50 years ago, you'd say to a, a child, well, you, know, you wouldn't behave like that if the Queen was sitting at the table. So it's sort of the, an appeal to the best, to the most tolerant, and to those sort of qualities in society that um, quite often get sort of uh, swamped either by debate or by social media um, flourishes and that kind of thing. And I think the value of the monarchy in a modern setting is that uh, with the right character and training and outlook, you have at the top of your constitution not only the steady focal point of enactment of legislation, state visits, speaking on behalf of the nation after 9-11. You have all those qualities, but also you have at a non-political and very high profile level a set of values that are actually um, treasured by many people all over the world, whether they live in dictatorships or, or in democracies. I think that whole period of uh, 92 to 95 um, was a very difficult time in family terms, I suppose, in terms of the professional job of advising the Queen and informing the media of all the engagements and uh, fixtures, visits and so on, which why they were being done and what was the purpose, uh, was something that you know went on regardless of whatever was happening privately. But I think, you know, the difficulties in the family in the mid-1990s with the separation of the Prince and Princess of Wales, uh, of the Yorks, uh, confirmation of uh, Princess Anne's divorce, that was not that something everyone expected, so it wasn't controversial. But I think having the private lives of the royal family being trawled over by the media, I think, was difficult. Um, and interfered in a way with, with um, people's perceptions of the monarchy and whether its purpose was as useful as it once was. I suppose a prime example is 1992, um, the Queen's Annus Horribilis impacted on the institution of monarchy. There were all sorts of people asking all sorts of questions, Are the monarch- is the monarchy relevant? Uh, at the end of the day it is because the monarchy has survived. But there were all sorts of things happening. 
that were nothing to do with the Queen. Charles and Diana in India, Diana at the Taj Mahal on her own, Charles in Bangalore delivering a keynote speech in the hope of selling British exports. That was, that's what visits were all about. Um, what else did we have? We had Seville Expo, we had Char Diana going off to Egypt um, on what should have been a very, very worthwhile tour. But everything she wanted to do, everything we had in the program, the Egyptians dismantled and said, no, you can't go to a woman's hospital, you can't do this, you can't do that, and it ended up as tourism. So what was the point? We had Anne um, finally divorcing Mark Phillips. We had the infamous photographs of Fergie having her toes sucked in the south of France, spread all over Sunday tabloid, um, which coincidentally she happened to be at Balmoral at the time and was told that it might be a good idea if she left and went back to London. Um, we had um, Andrew and Fergie's separation, Charles and Diana's separation, uh, Diana talking to Andrew Morton, not directly, but indirectly. Andrew Morton uh, book, Diana, her true story. And then the Queen, um, on the uh, 20th anniversary, wedding anniversary, Windsor Castle, where the southeast corner of Windsor Castle went up in smoke. I don't think anyone could have believed just how many blows were striking the royals then. You know, it's almost as if on New Year's Day, 1992, the royal family still, whatever the wars of the Wales is, whatever the problems behind the scenes for other couples, the royal family still looked much as it always had been. By the end of it, not only was, you know, their historic home partly in ruins, there were demands that they should pay taxes, uh, and the entire world knew that the marriages of three of the, 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 of the Queen's children uh, were in tatters. Prince Edward had had to discuss rumours he was gay. The question of Prince Charles's position, future position then, began even to look a little more dubious. And it's no doubt that in that speech, a visibly uh, shaken Queen spoke of her Annus Horribilis and of the need basically for kindness from press and public. And if you think about Elizabeth II, about her very famously upright, stalwart persona, how she was bred never to show her feelings, how it's natural to her, you know, never complain, never explain. To do that, to actually ask for public sympathy and press gentleness is amazing. When Diana died, uh, she was getting horrendous press about remaining in Scotland, not coming back to London. Uh, why was she remaining in Scotland? It didn't matter how much you explained, people weren't interested. The media understand now that she was remaining in Scotland because she had two grandchildren, age 15 and 12 respectively, and they needed somebody. And the Queen and Prince Philip, with very secure heads on their shoulders, were able to deal with, with the problem. Why hasn't the Queen said anything? Well, she was going to say something, she was going to pay tribute to Diana, but in her time. She does everything in her time, not to order, and her timing is usually very perfect. So when she did get back to London on the Friday, on the eve of the funeral, we were apprehensive because there had been this hostile press. I was alongside her when she went to visit the uh, firstly to Chapel Royal to pay her respects to Diana, then to look at the visitors' books and books of condolence at St James's Palace, and then a walkabout outside the railings of Buckingham Palace. We had an enclosure there. She looked at the floral tributes, she read the inscription, she spoke to mourners, she laid flowers down, as did Prince Philip, on behalf of mourners. And on the way out, a young girl, about 11 or 12, had a bunch of, I think they were roses or carnations, uh, they were red, and the Queen said, can I put those down for you? And this girl said, no, Your Majesty, these are for you. So the press hadn't read the tea leaves correctly. And as the Queen left, when she arrived, she got polite applause, and as she left the enclosure, she got polite applause, and she looked me in the eye. And you had to read the Queen to understand her. And I knew exactly what she was thinking. And I looked at her and I said, that was fine, Your Majesty.
that was fine. And we walked back together and I saw her to her car and she went in into the palace. Two hours later, her tribute to Diana, the television companies, networks, had actually put television screens so that everybody milling around there could see and hear the broadcast. And at the end of it, there was applause. So she did everything in her time, not to order, and people were satisfied that, yes, she had come back to London, she had paid tribute to Diana, she had done a walkabout, and she had looked at the floral tributes. And that meant a lot to everybody milling around there. I believe the Queen was moved by everything she saw when she was sitting all alone at the funeral of Prince Philip in St George's Chapel. She was alone because of Covid regulations, uh, limiting the number of people, social distancing, and here was this 95-year-old woman mourning the loss of her, her liege man of 73 years and nobody close to comfort her. And yet, you wouldn't have drawn anything from her appearance. Admittedly, most of her face was covered with a black mask. But inwardly, she would have felt grief. But outwardly, I suppose the royal family, she's of that generation that was brought up by a generation that had Victorian values uh, and Edwardian values, and they were brought up not to show emotion, not to express emotion in public. Uh, and it's worked for her. And I thought, I think the Queen had that you know, great ability to absorb those sort of very difficult experiences and keep calm um, at the centre of it. So, but I think all that experience sort of builds up and produces a character uh, very interesting to work for. And in the case of the Queen, um, a great public figure with a very strong set of values. Well, the Queen carried on, which is what um, the, the, the Queen has, has typically done at moments of crisis. Um, you know, even um, as, as um, the, 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 certainly the smaller newspapers, but really all newspapers at that time, were indulging in, in a kind of orgiastic frenzy of, of horrid revelations, the Queen continued um, to carry out unspectacular daily engagements as she had from the beginning of her reign, if you like. It's leading by example, isn't it? It is the summer of 2022, and the whole of the country seems to be celebrating the platinum jubilee of Queen Elizabeth II. She is the longest reigning monarch in British history. Never has she been more popular, even after 70 years as head of state. moments. The one was when the Queen herself appeared on the balcony of Buckingham Palace. Now, she's done that so many times in her reign, but this one felt different, partly because Covid, of course, had, you know, meant that she hadn't been able to be there in person, but also that glorious skit with Paddington. Well, I think that what was extraordinary was the number of people who came out. I mean, I've worked on all the Jubilees since 1977, 2002, 2012, and I, I've, I've seen that the, the pattern is usually apathy to begin with, and then suddenly the British public wake up and realise they can have fun, and massive celebration when the day comes. But I think this time there was no apathy at all. There was concern, of course, because the Queen's health had been poor, and what what part would she play in it? And so there was a, a slightly, um, um, you know, fin de siècle feeling about the whole thing that, you know, probably there won't be another jubilee, you know, and that sort of thing, which is, you know, there's a tinge of sadness. But that Thursday, the Trooping the Colour, 
I mean, they had to close the park. They couldn't let more people in it. I mean, it was just absolutely packed. It was becoming a worry. History will look and remember the Queen for a long, long time. Because we are a country of almost 70 million, the United Kingdom that is, a Commonwealth of billions, and everybody has probably grown up with Queen Elizabeth II. She's always been our queen, and, and, and what an extraordinary reign to have lived in. I, I've thought about this a lot, and I cannot think of another reign in history in which I would have preferred to live. And actually, the queen kept going, no matter how rough things got. During COVID, you know, when uh, the queen made the broadcast, the key broadcast during COVID at Easter and then at Christmas 2020, and they have a very gentle, quiet way of saying, look, these are hard times, but things will get better. We, we shall meet again, we shall see our friends again, we shall be into our families again. I think people thought, well, she's saying that because she believes it. She's not trying to pour balm on our wounds. She's actually expressing a philosophy that um, you need to be looking forward, you need to be open, you need to be compassionate. We need to be helping other people who are worse off. I think Elizabeth II is one of our great monarchs, not just because she's reigned for so long, but I think she's kept the monarchy relevant to the public at a time when it was under unprecedented threats. If we were to put a tag on Queen Elizabeth II, as they used to do, you know, Ethel read the unready and so on, I think it would be Elizabeth the Steadfast. I think her supreme achievement as she always knew herself, was basically being there, remaining there. Well, I think that historians um, would be very foolish if they did not consider that it was one of the greatest reigns that has ever been um, in this um, curious, uh, changing world. The stability of the Queen, the, her calm approach to things, her, her generosity, her willingness to work very hard, her philosophy, as I understand it, is um, do your best every day and say your prayers at night. That's, she has been known to say that, and it's not a bad philosophy, actually.
I think the Queen herself would consider her nurturing of the Commonwealth, its growth from nine nations to 54 nations, um, it, it, its status as a mouthpiece for aspirations to good, to, to be a real achievement. And I think also the fact that the Queen has sustained a concept of global monarchy, that she has this global presence that, that no other sovereign on earth has, it is a real achievement because it's so wonderfully positive for British prestige. It has been an extraordinary achievement. Um, and I think possibly one that at times people thought wouldn't, wouldn't happen, that at the end of the 70 years, the monarchy has survived and flourished. The Queen has been absolutely extraordinary from the moment that she took the crown after her father's death in 1952. She has devoted herself to the country and to the Commonwealth. It's been a long, long journey. If you think of all the places she's been, all the people she's met, all the charities she's supported, all the regiments she's done, all the ministers she's talked to, uh, all the different issues she's had to deal with, all the different problems that have come up, not only with her family, um, but with other things, the things she has to think about, which we don't have to think about, um, which concern her. I think she's been absolutely remarkable. The Queen will be remembered. Her legacy will be one of commitment and duty. They've been paramount throughout her life.